Hi guys, and this time I'd like to present this, the Star Trek Next Generation Technical Manual, a fascinating look inside the USS Enterprise NCC-1701D. Now, unlike the last couple of technical manuals we've looked at, this one is more official, because it's by Rick Sternbach and Michael Acuda, who were working behind the scenes on Star Trek Next Generation, doing a lot of the visual effects and coming up with the Technobabble. Michael Acuda especially I'm aware of because he came up with the Acudagrams, the visual display units, all the control panels and things aboard the Enterprise in the series. He created something which looked very natural. It looked like a proper computer interface. Fantastic stuff. Now, this came out in 1991, so basically during Season 5 of the show. So, in some ways, this is kind of like a writer's manual as well. Because they lay out how the technology works. Because they were very keen on putting rules in place. There's some wonderful footnotes in here. As well as being comical ones where they reveal that the control surfaces in the sick bay had a gauge for measuring medical insurance remaining. That the engineering section had um, an infinite improbability drive from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy listed amongst its functions. And the big display board which showed the cutaway of the Enterprise, they include a version in here, and you can see the silly things they put on it. You know, there's a giant rubber duck, there's all sorts of things put into the cutaway of the ship that they actually put on screen. But apart from that, there's some notes which explain why they made decisions and laying down the rules. So they talk about, for example, in one episode, they didn't want to be able to use the transporter while ships were traveling at warp speed but they could see how that would interfere with things in later episodes how other writers might be uh, written into a corner by that rule so they left themselves an escape clause which was two ships can transport between one another as long as they're going exactly the same speed so the relative speed between them is zero you can use the transporters and they use that in the later episode, Best of Both Worlds, when they're beaming across to rescue Picard when he's been taken by the Borg. Uh, O'Brien mentions that they have matched warp velocities for transport. And it's wonderful glimpses in behind the scenes which show how much they were thinking ahead. They weren't just changing the technology to suit the episode. They were thinking ahead how the technology might be used in the future, and to not box themselves in. Something I think modern Star Trek doesn't do so well, because you see episodes where they introduce um, technology and then never use it again. Um, the Star Trek rebooted movie in 2009, where they use warp drive in conjunction with transporters to beam people across the galaxy. Well, why do they never use that again? They've got an ability to basically avoid travelling in ships and just beam between planets using warp transporters or whatever they call it but nobody ever uses it again it's never mentioned and this technology is often done and um, there's a big problem in strange new worlds that i disliked where the chief medical officer keeps his daughter held in a transporter beam that's active all the time and i just was waiting for an episode where the ship was damaged and power was cut off to go well that's her gone the transporters have no power she's dead but they wrote themselves out of that one. But it's bad planning by making things, well, why don't they keep using that? The next time that somebody has a disease, just put them in the transporter and hold them there for months until you come up with a cure. You can never write an episode where people are becoming ill and dying again because you have created this get-out clause. And the next-gen writers never did this. Anyway, let's have a look at the back cover because I'm ranting on already and we haven't even opened up the book. So, written by Stern Rick Sternbach and Michael Acuda, the technical advisor on Star Trek Next Generation, and Star Trek the Next Generation Technical Manual takes you on a guided tour through the new USS Enterprise. From the bridge to the shuttle bays, from the transporter room to the cruise quarters, this book provides a never-before-seen glimpse at the inner workings of the most incredible starship ever conceived by two of the designers who helped create it. Full of diagrams, technical schematics, ship's plans, the Star Trek Next Generation Technical Manual also takes a detailed look at the principles behind Star Trek's awesome technology, from phasers to warp drive to the incredible holodeck. A must for all fans, this one book that examines the full spectrum of technology 
behind the fantastic Star Trek Next Generation universe and gives a fantastic behind-the-scenes glimpses into the making of the hit television show. And inside, although it's not colour plates, it is black and white throughout, um, just plain print, we get an introduction by Gene Roddenberry telling how the Enterprise is not just a starship. It's a method of telling stories. And he talks through all of that. Um, a fascinating glimpse into creating a starship which isn't just realistic on screen, but is a method for getting your stories over. We've got stuff from the author's introduction, talking about all the people they've worked with. And then we've got an introduction to the USS Enterprise itself, including the Galaxy-class Starship Development Project logo. So we talk through the design for the ship, what they wanted it to do from an in-universe point of view. Now, the original Enterprise emblem and the current version of the Starfleet emblem. The evolution of the Starship, so Kirk's Enterprise. The movie one, the Enterprise B. Obviously, they changed it from being a plain old Excelsior class to a modified one in the Generations movie, but that's not to be made for another four or five years at this point. Um, Enterprise C, which had been featured in the episode, and the Enterprise D. A general overview, talking about the design of the ship, the living areas, laying out everything from reaction thrusters to airlocks. Absolutely fabulous. As I said, we've got these cutaway images, which are displayed on the wall. And if we look carefully, we can see little things. Um, there's a mouse there. I don't know if you can make it out on the camera. It's very tiny. Um, there's a Dakota aircraft. There's, I think, a side view of the Empire State Building in there. Um, I can't quite see where the rubber duck is. I don't remember. There's a giant rubber duck somewhere. That looks like a tank. Um, up oh, there's the rubber duck. It's all near the top. Um, and these are on the big display board. We've got these footnotes, which are quite massive in areas where they talk about different things. Um, out of universe. Um, the board which is on the bridge of the Enterprise with all the writers and things put up as the engineers behind creating the Enterprise D. They all get credited. We've got the construction chronology. How the Galaxy class ships were being built side by side and to get them into service they borrowed bits from one another. Um, certain elements were borrowed from the galaxy to get the Enterprise working and vice versa. It goes through as they add different systems in. One of the fantastic bits that they do in this book is they actually designed the Galaxy Class D, or the Enterprise D, to be future-proof. The idea of this massive vessel, because it is hundreds of metres long, far bigger than needed for the Thousand Crew, although a Thousand Crew is quite enormous. Um, but there are empty spaces designed into it, so they can add new things later. The idea is for this starship to be like a modern aircraft carrier or something, and have a life of maybe 40 or 50 years, not just seven years of a television series. Um, something I'm sad to see they haven't carried on through in Picard Season 3, where you should still have some Galaxy-class vessels in the fleet, although they are... Um, replaced by that period. And we talk about the uh, coordinate system and how to navigate, um, the secondary hull, how the hull's built up, inertial dampening systems, so the delay, why the ship, whenever it manoeuvres, everybody leans to one side, um, because the inertial dampening systems take a few moments to react. They write it into the universe, how the source of separation systems work. The saucer designed to land on planets as a survival lifeboat should the ship receive catastrophic damage. As we see in the movie Generations, which as I said is four or five years after this book was written. So they were writing ahead, or they were using this book when they were writing the um, movie script. And um, we're talking about command systems, so the main bridge here. Um, it talks about how they're swappable, something I, I know my role-playing group use, because even though we're on an Intrepid-class vessel, he uses the map for the Enterprise D, so I assume we've just got the same command module plugged in. Our captain preferred this kind of bridge to the Voyager style. 
Um, it talks about in the footnote how the bridge modules they built in that they should be swappable because they use a Reliant class vessel, um, Miranda class rather, the Reliant, the Saratoga, the Lantry and the Bretagne. Um, but the bridge on each is different. So the captains just decided to have a different bridge layout. They unplugged the module and plugged in a fresh one. Navigation across the galaxy, tactical functions, science stations, engineering stations, how the sensors work, sensor pallets which can be swapped in and out, what the different diagnostic levels mean. We often see in episodes where they're like, oh, we're looking for a fault. We'll do a level one diagnostic. Well, it talks through how that's handled. And we've got automated procedures, you know, level five diagnostics, which take place on a daily basis. They only take two and a half seconds to run. <laughs> we've got the battle bridge and engineering. Um, one of the pieces talks about how the people step onto the sets and feel say they feel like it's being there, but there's something missing. And it talks about the sound effects, the rumble of the engines really makes it seem more realistic. We've got this display of the computer section, giant computer cores. Basically, the Galaxy class gets mentioned in one of the early episodes of Next Generation as being the largest mobile computer. And we see this multi-floor computer system. Now, the computer room was introduced in one episode, which involved, I think, nanites trying to take over control of the ship and they were infesting the computer. But they reused that set for a few things. And I always bothered me in episodes because... While it made sense to be fixing the computer in the computer room, they then do things like trials. They take um, a Klingon in who they're interrogating and interrogate him in the same room. Why would you take him into the core of the biggest computer system you've got? <laughs> Surely you'd be keeping him in the brig or something like that. But they were just reusing a set. And how the pads work. Now these are obviously very much like tablets these days. They're a bit more basic. But it talks very futuristically for when the book was written as i said it was 1991 how they're networked together and basically you could pilot the ship from one of these um everything can be done with isolinear optical chips and warp field theory and application showing how they rejig the warp speeds and how power use required um we've got the matter antimatter reactor the mara and um, showing the layout so we've got this huge deuterium fuel tank at the top, and then we've got the antimatter storage pods at the bottom where they can be easily ejected because they are the dangerous ones, whereas this is just hydrogen gas. The layout of the warp core, and the injectors inside it. So much detail. The dilithium crystal um, adjustment frame we hear about. The inside of the nacelles, now it shows how they're laid out, and again in season 7, so a couple of years after this book was uh, written, there's an episode where they get to look down the inside of the nacelle, and these designs hold up. Uh, warp fields, as I said, the big deuterium tank, um, antimatter generators, how the warp fields work and they gather in hydrogen into the tanks for long distance operations, emergency shutdown procedures, impulse uh, propulsion systems, again showing the antimatter pods getting injected and the warp core itself. Um, impulse drives, how they can swap out the thrusters independently to keep the drives operating for longer if they need repairs while in flight. Wonderfully thought through. Um, and navigational deflectors, tractor beams, it mentions how they put only one tractor beam into the original design, but then realised it was kind of stupid that everything they used the tractor beam on had to be below the ship. So they went and added more to the design later on. Their ship, like the fictional one it portrays, evolves, they mention. Um, talk through replicators and how information stored in them. One of the weird things that I notice it says is it doesn't store motion. So when you replicate food, it's always perfectly still. I don't know what foods are moving when you eat them, but I found it a very particular thing they added in. We've got the communication system. So how you can communicate from your personal comm badge, other devices such as pads, tricorders, desktop terminals. It talks through how they're used. Um, the systems, so as soon as somebody wants to speak to you, it instantly puts you through. There's no kind of privacy. 
But we see in episodes people, you know, Captain Picard tries to speak to Counselor Troy and she's like, oh, what is it now? But he doesn't hear her say that. <laughs> so the system must have some kind of censoring built in. Um, distance across the subspace relay networks so are long distance communications. The automated subspace radio platforms, we see one of those. How the Universal Translator works. Now it's sort of routed through the comm badge back to the ship's computer, which is a very handy way of doing it because all you need to do is disrupt communications and the characters are out of the loop. They can't use the Universal Translator to speak to everybody. But because they're wearing one most of the time, you can just ignore the fact that different aliens speak different languages. We go through the transporter systems, including a wonderful breakdown of from the moment you press a sequence initiation to transport somebody, what happens? It talks through how you can transport people site to site, but that kind of uses two pads. Essentially, you're beaming somebody to the transporter room and instantly transporting them elsewhere. So you can beam them from a planet surface to the bridge of the ship, but they are kind of going via the transporter room. They just don't materialize there. They're just being stored. Hence these um, pattern buffers, which we hear mentioned. Other transporter functions, limitations of use, their range, how long it takes to recharge them. Um, we've got the sensor systems, I said, the sensor pallets, navigational sensors, the different types of probes they send out. You know, you hear them mentioning send out a class seven pr probe. And it details exactly what they do. The functions of the tricorder, exactly what they do, including the remote um, handheld sensor. We often see the medical personnel, uh, Beverly Crusher, holding a little thing along with her tricorder as she scans somebody. Well, it explains what that does. Science department operations. We've got the tactical systems going through all the weapons placement. Now we've got the different types of torpedo. Quantum torpedoes were introduced later. I think they were in some episodes of Next Generation. They were definitely in Deep Space Nine. Up until this point, they were photon torpedoes. But we detail how they work. The idea of source of separation for battle. So we've got the battle bridge for the secondary hull. Tactical policies, including the phasers. Um, I do find it amusing in here. We've got the available power settings and effects. So setting one, which is light stun. Right up to setting 16, explosive disruption effects. Um, I believe heavy geologic displacement. Uh, me and my friends have often joked in Star Trek type games that, you know, set phasers to heavy geologic, geologic displacement mode. <laughs> Melt through rocks. The deflector shields and how will they work? Auto destruct systems, detailing them because they are used a couple of times in the series. Or they are activated but never fully used. Environmental systems. Including some stuff about the ship has water breathing creatures. Basically, some dolphins are part of the navigation crew because they navigate in three dimensions, whereas humans and most other species only navigate in two because they have full freedom of movement through water. So, it's a, they use this as dolphins are intelligent creatures, they are part of the crew. So, they have a deck which is basically just flooded. So they can swim around, although we never see that in the episodes. I believe they are detailed on the Blueprints box set that they brought out as well. And I mentioned how the system recycles everything, and on the set they started recycling everything. Um, basically reaching across to the movies and across Paramount, they introduced recycling. We all agree the goal of protecting our environment is worth it. We've got cruise air support systems. So the medical systems and facilities, medical tricorders, hypersprays, food replicators, how they work, uh, turbo lift systems on how to get around the ship, the turbo lift cars that we see from the outside a couple of times. It makes a lot more sense in this than it does in Discovery, where we see the turbo lifts basically just fly around this cavernous area inside the ship. Um, how the holodeck works. That basically it's creating holograms for things in the distance, but replicating things nearby and ma uh, manipulating them with tractor beams. It explains how Captain Picard gets hit by a snowball through the open door in the first episode, but certain other things can't leave later because the holodeck did actually replicate 
these snowballs or the snow for the people so it'd feel cold. Um, auxiliary spacecraft systems, so shuttle bays, the different types of shuttlecraft. Um, extra ve uh, vehicular suits, including this giant robot one, which we never see in an episode. Um, it's some kind of repair thing, but I thought the work bees were those. I really like the design of the work bees. This looks hugely clunky in comparison to most Star Trek stuff. And we've got the captain's yacht. The bulge on the bottom of the ship is supposed to be an independent vessel of its own, although we never see it used. Um, Enterprise flight modes. So cruise mode, yellow alert, red alert, exactly what happens, you know, what systems come up, how the warp core powers itself up automatically. Isolation doors and force fields are automatically closed between sections. External support modes, separated flight modes, reduced power modes. We've got emergency operations, including how the fire suppression system works by creating small force fields around the fires so they consume all the oxygen and they go out by themselves. I dread to think what would happen if somebody lit a cigarette. Would it put a force field around their head until the cigarette went out? Emerging medical operations, you know, how the ship operates if you're trying to evacuate a planet or something like that in a big uh, disaster. We've got the lifeboats and the locations of all of them. We don't really see lifeboats launched from a galaxy class, but we do see them launched in um, First Contact from the Sovereign class. And it mentions that they put a lot of uh, empty lifeboat ports onto the models in Best of Both Worlds for the fleet that had been destroyed at Wolf 359. Talks about the projected upgrades, you know, how the ship will last. Um, Major upgrades are scheduled for 20-year intervals. The ship removes service for approximately one year, so the work such as computer core swap-out or warp core replacement can take place. I'm um, talking about how the Galaxy class is really supposed to last a long time. But future directions, the road to 1701E, which it talks about being the Nova class and offers some designs. Well, the Nova class was something they introduced in Voyager, which is a much smaller science ship. I'm not sure it was supposed to be anything to do with these. And none of these look like the Galaxy class anyway. Uh, sorry, the Sovereign class anyway. Talk about the mission background. And then an afterword by Rick Berman. We've got the index and key, some units of measure, and about the authors. Uh, Rick Sternbach and Michael Acuda, and a lovely picture of them with Gene Roddenberry. Now this book is absolutely fantastic. I love it to bits. Um, they brought out Deep Space Nine one, and I really do love Deep Space Nine slightly more than I like Next Generation. But this book is far superior because it concentrates on one subject and details it. I have to admit that when I'm playing Star Trek role playing game, it's a number of these things I draw on. All the Trekna babble that you need to get through Star Trek adventures, I draw from here. You know, oh well, the transporters work like this, and the Games Master, like, that sounds okay. Okay, it does. Now, sometimes I'm drawing directly out of the book from my memories, and other times I'm making it up. Sorry, mate, if you're watching, I apologise. I've been conning you all this time. But anyway, I think I've witted on for quite long enough, as usual. So thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.